Hello everyone, this is Craig Fitch. Welcome to another Oculus and iCar webinar. We certainly thank you for attending this evening's webinar titled Using Ophthalmic Instrumentation to, de to Detect Conditions Earlier, Monitor Treatment, Better Patient Care, and Increase Reimbursement. Our speaker this evening is Robert Rebello, the CEO of NTN Software, the makers of iCore Medical Coding and Reimbursement Software. Robert Rebello is a nationally known expert on all issues related to billing and coding. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use your question box. So without further ado, please welcome Robert Rebello. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I know that probably not everybody has uh, logged on yet, but I want to get started with this as soon as possible so that we can fit everything in. Um, uh, I need to get control again. There we go. Uh, basically, as Craig said, if you have any questions to ask, use the chat function. Uh, we've actually considered the seminar to be broken down into three sections. At the end of each section, Craig will see if there are questions for that and then uh, present those to me. Uh, try to ha uh, if you have any questions, so ask him. Uh, he'll do it through the chat function, as I just said. Um, uh, the topic for the seminar, there's actually, as I said, three different sections here. I want to really hit each of these, they're very important. The first one is increasing your reimbursement and really focus on some of the tools that you have or some tools or instrumentation that you should be obtaining um, and use this even for wellness patients and that's where we're going to start. So even if you're not obtaining reimbursement for some of these procedures, the fact that you have the procedures, you have the instrumentation, you can perform the procedures on wellness patients, and hopefully if you do find something at a much earlier stage, it's going to allow you to convert that patient into a medical patient. That indicates significant increase in reimbursement for you, and it's also a major advantage for the patient because you're able to diagnose certain conditions at a much earlier stage, which yields a better clinical outcome. Um, we're going to also talk about coding your exam for increased reimbursement and compliance. Uh, one of the things that we see um, frequently for different people around the country, whether we're doing an audit for a practice to make sure they're compliant, uh, or just questions that we get as part of i where the doctors can ask coding questions or billing questions, is that most doctors are underbilling. They're not doing all the procedures they could do. Even though, and especially those that are really related to the diagnosis, and we're going to be getting into that and how to increase your reimbursement there. The, the third category are audits. Um, I don't know how many, if any of you, uh, these attendees were at my previous Oculus webinar. Um, I'm really focusing in a lot on the audits. Uh, this is very serious. Uh, I just actually got a call from one of our i users asking about auditing and our pre-audit service because he had heard so many horror stories and wanted to know if they were really true. We're going to get into this because the insurance companies are very serious about this. Um, uh, different med CMS has already published information where they find that they can retrieve from audits six times what it costs them to do the audit. That's one indication. The other indication on audits is that we see typically an average audit with a negative finding for a solo OD provider is between $100,000 and $200,000. I'll get into that in more detail. I've had a number of users, uh, excuse me, people who have been in my seminars or webinars previously, I've had several of them say that they thought this was an exaggeration, it wasn't as bad. Uh, they informed me they got hit with audits and they range right in that same area between $100,000 and $200,000. Very serious business, so we're really uh, spending some time. It is something that uh, when we do an audit for practice to make sure they're compliant, we frequently or constantly, I should say, hear from the practice owner or doctor saying, I'm pretty sure my records are compliant. However, just for peace of mind, I want you to do an audit. We look at the records, and in every case, we find a number of issues, in some case on all exams, that would cause them to fail an audit, which is a significant finding and a lot of money that has to be paid back to the payers. Uh, all of a sudden, my control is slowed down. Here we go. 
Um, so let's get started. We're familiar with the concept of performing wellness fund disposals. Most practices do it. What we really want to talk about is talk about some other devices as well as patient medications that will provide you with tools to either find something at an earlier stage or in the case of medications, which we'll, I'll talk about, that the patients are on certain high-risk medications with ocular side effects automatically allow you to perform medical procedures even though this patient came in as a wellness patient. So we really want to focus in on those devices, the instrumentation, etc. And it'll, um, it will allow you, as I said earlier, to perform and bill additional medical procedures. Uh, it's an increased uh, uh, reimbursement, uh, far in excess of wellness exam fees, a major benefit for the practice in terms of reimbursement, and also a benefit for the patient. Again, it allows you uh, to diagnose a medical condition at an earlier stage, providing a better clinical outcomes for the patient, major advantage for the patient. So we really want to, those are some of the things we're going to be talking about next. Um, there's also a lot of confusion about what happens in that scenario. You're providing a medical exam to a patient, and during that exam, you discover a medical issue. And what we want to talk about is the process uh, which you want to do. First is inform the patient of your diagnosis. One of the issues that you have is, in many cases, your wellness refractive patients only see you as somebody providing them with new glasses, new contact lenses, etc. And what you want to do is make sure they understand that it's, that it's a different um, environment now that you are their medical uh, eye care provider, and the best way to do this, it's not the only way, is complete that wellness exam and then schedule that patient for a follow-up medical exam. Now, if it's serious and you have time, for example, if somebody has a detached retina or some other serious issue, then it obviously makes really very little sense to complete a wellness exam. Uh, one of the things that you can do is if they don't want to return for one reason or another, they're there for the wellness exam, that's all they care about. And you do find something, one of the things you can do is bill the wellness insurance for that wellness exam. And let's say, for example, somebody has glaucoma uh, or glaucoma suspect even. Then you can do fundus photos, you can do visual fields. If instead of fundus, you can do OCT, there's a number of procedures that you can perform on that patient. On that same day as the wellness exam, you can bill those medically. But you cannot bill a medical exam as the, at the same time you bill a wellness uh, exam. A number of doctors tell me, oh, I do it all the time, and I get paid by both the wellness insurance and the medical. They're absolutely right. They're going to get paid. However, one, if either one of those insurers find out that you're billing both on the same day, they will both audit you and both come after you. You cannot bill two different insurance companies for an exam that you perform on the same day. So you need to make sure. So one of the things when we talk about wellness exams, what's the primary purpose of a wellness exam? And whether it's contact lenses or frames and lenses, for the, a number of people say it's to provide, prescribe new lenses. Actually, that should be secondary. What you're really thinking about doing is diagnosing a problem at an earlier stage, finding out if there's something other, other that's going on. So again, we talked about wellness funders' photos. Many do. We're going to actually look at some alternatives uh, in addition to the, what we've already seen. Um, I forget. This is a, a, I made some changes, uh, and I, this, this one I didn't catch, but I'll, this actually is out of place, but I'll get into it now. Uh, what's the number one problem with optometrists and many ophthalmologists when building a medical issue? And it's they, you build the exam and little or nothing else. One of the things we consistently find in practices around the country is underbilling, where, and in some cases the doctors tell us, oh, I was afraid to bill more procedures, or I did the procedures, but I didn't want to bill them, or in many cases, it's, I didn't know you could do that procedure for that diagnosis. But the bottom line is you're losing reimbursement if you practice that way. Um, there are what we call allowed reimbursable procedures. Those are specific ophthalmic procedures that you can perform and they are supported by that particular diagnosis. They're allowed for that diagnosis. Those are the ones that we will focus in on a little bit later 
to show you to make sure that you're actually billing and performing the procedures and you're billing them correctly and fully so that you increase your reimbursement. It is critical that you do that. Uh, let's also talk about how coding is established. Uh, one of the things when I do my lectures face-to-face -face with doctors, I always sit and make the comment about how coding is so uh, organized, it's so logical. Of course, none of that is true. It's very logical. There's a lot of extra stuff in the way you code that's it's totally unnecessary, but it's part of what is, is going on. The other thing is we find that when you have people in different locations, what procedures one doctor in one state can do cannot be performed by a doctor in a different state for the same diagnosis. And the reason for that is as follows. CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, sets national standards. Those are called NCDs, National Coverage Determination. And what they do is for every medical procedure that can be performed, they create an NCD. It shows what diagnosis codes support that procedure, who can perform the procedure, any restrictions on that procedure, frequency limitations, et cetera. And that is set nationally. Then what happens, the local payers then set their own standards. And for Medicare alone, not even considering the other insurance companies, there are 95 regions in the country for Medicare. Some states like California has nine, Texas has seven, some states like New Hampshire, Rhode Island, et cetera, only have one. But not one of the local payers follow the CMS national standards. They all change them. And that's why, and we, uh, for example, we get doctors calling us where they're on the same study group, and one doctor in California, for example, called us and said that he could see he could do a certain procedure for that diagnosis. A member of the study group in Colorado said, no, you can't, and they wanted me to referee the argument, and I told them they were both right. could do it in California, can't do it in Colorado. In an extreme case, uh, we were at a SECO meeting, and somebody from Florida came up to me and said, how many procedures can I do for this diagnosis? excuse me, the other way around, uh, what uh, diagnosis code support a certain procedure? And there were 37 or 8 different diagnosis codes that supported that procedure. Somebody in another state asked me to look at the same exact procedure, and there were only three diagnosis codes that support it. It varies that much. Uh, it's something that doesn't make sense, but it's just the way the rules are. Um, it's one of the things that we always mention because doctors tell us uh, their EHR system has coding guidelines, tells them what procedures they can do. Be very careful about that. We, we hear from a number of practices where when they follow it, their denials go up or they're missing things, and that's because a lot of the, or most of the EHR systems use national coding standards, not your local specific to your region, and many of them, they put them in, implemented them years ago, and it's never been updated. So be very careful in using that type of thing. We also find a lot of EHR systems, because they're doing it that way, end up with non-compliant exams. So again, caution. Um, let's talk about some case studies. Here's where, and, and oh, went too far. Um, here's where, uh, and these were supplied by Oculus uh, these show specific things that you can see um, where he, they've done uh, optical tomography, anterior seg. Uh, there's the procedure code, uh, and it's anterior with the information, and narrow angle glaucoma was diagnosed on this particular patient. And then, so the next thing, and again, here's something where they advocating using this instrument, the Pentacam, uh, for a patient, even if they don't have a known diagnosis, where you can at least look at this, take, uh, take the image, and determine if you're finding a certain condition, in this case, narrow angle glaucoma. And in this case, now we're showing you uh, <coughs> excuse me, all the specific uh, procedures that you can perform uh, with narrow angle glaucoma, and we're just using the unspecified one, not one of the specific ones. Uh, where you can see all the procedures you can do and what exam types you can do just based on that diagnosis. So it really is a significant you know, number of procedures you can perform 
And as an end result, just as one example, here's where we're showing for a new patient medically, a level three exam, fundus photos, scanning laser, visual field, and gonio, and the total reimbursement is $360. Now, a number of you probably have already noticed that. Fundus photos and scanning laser are mutually exclusive. I will talk about that a little later. Uh, so these procedures are actually done where every procedure except for example scanning laser was done on day one and then the patient returned for the scanning laser uh, either the, the same uh, the next day or sometime in the next week as long as it's a different date of service you can bill it on one claim. Here's another example where again the pentacam and in this case we're looking at using it and in this case, it was a documentation of cataract, where you have all the information about the cataract patient. So now you've diagnosed with cataract, or you get more information about the cataract than just with the slip lamp exam. And now, based on that particular diagnosis, here are all the procedures uh, for senile nucleosclerosis cataract that can be performed. And this is very consistent, or somewhat consistent, uh, from region to region. Again, uh, if anybody has specific questions about if that applies, you can let me know and we can get you that information for your state or uh, region. So here we're seeing all the procedures that can be performed. And then, um, oh, so this came up before. And so we've added this to the slide. Uh, how many, how frequently you can perform and build these procedures. And even if it's a stable chronic cataract condition, the fact that it's stable and a chronic and you, this immediate surgery is not required, you can continue to follow that patient un, until they require the cataract surgery and build those procedures that you're performing for that patient. Stable chronic is a specific risk element uh, that you can document and make sure that you, uh, it supports a level 3 E&M exam. So the procedures, you can see everything, the case study, here you have the cataract. You can do A or B scans. Then they're going to the ophthalmologist for a pre-op exam, the IOL measurements, then find the surgical procedure, and they come back to you for post-op care. Here's another example for keratoconus. Again, using the Pentacam, where it actually documents this is the level of keratoconus. So you can see exactly what's going on. And with keratoconus, there's been some significant changes uh, to what can be built. And uh, in this example, we're looking external ocular photography. That is either slit lamp photos or external. Um, you also topography. And now with the change last year, it also covers initial fitting of contact lenses to treat keratoconus. Previously, it would not support or pay for keratoconus lenses. Now, that's a good size reimbursement. I understand it doesn't cover some of the lenses, but at least there's a, 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 the availability to build that uh, initial fitting of the contact lens for carrot to treat keratoconus. Uh, and by the way, we have the, uh, up down the very bottom, there's four different types of keratoconus stuff for diagnosis. The procedures are identical between any of them, the unspecified, stable, or acute. So any of those are all the same. And here's the contact lens uh, fitting for information where the Pentacam software actually gives you the contact lens fitting information for that keratoconus patient. And then uh, the, the billing, as I showed you before. So here's that Pentacam system that not only can show you the degree of keratoconus, but actually give you a map, full mapping of the, the, for the fitting. And again, uh, where you're doing the height, the height measurement, scleral lenses, et cetera, all part of the Pentacam software. And then finally, the billing for that, if it's keratoconus in both eyes, here you have an established patient level three exam, external ocular photography, topography, and then the initial fitting for both right eye and left eye 
for a total reimbursement of $467. Here's the case where a number of doctors are using that Pendicam for refractive instrumentation in the pretest area so that you do the refractive uh, uh, fitting and at the same time you have all the diagnostic information with this particular device having that multi-use uh, so it can be used throughout the, in the pretest area as well as for medical. Um, I guess at this point, any questions on that part on the the instrumentation? I'm just having a quick look right now. It uh, looks like there is one question, but uh, I'm unable to I'm unable to read it. If uh, we can come back to that one in a moment, uh, here we go. It says, "Does screening, does the screening version of, say, fundus photos have to be of a lower quality resolution than the version that you would do if you were billing fundus photos to the medical insurance as medical necessity?" The answer is absolutely, and there's very specific guidelines, and that's a great question. Um, and the way it works is that. Starting several years ago, when um, they came out with the first of some of the fundus cameras, um, where uh, they had that screening, that they were primarily there for screening, and doctors were paying, or excuse me, being paid by the patient for that screening photo, typically around thirty dollars. Well, when that started happening, CMS woke up and took note and said, "Listen." What we're going to do is if you routinely, and they never defined routinely, so my feeling if it's more than 20%, that's routine, uh, and you're taking fundus photos and billing the patient, even when you find a medical issue, you cannot bill Medicare. And the other insurance companies followed along. So the, the fundus camera companies, and we actually were consulted with many of those fundus camera companies about the proper way to do this that you have to have either, a for the wellness photos, a lower resolution or a wider angle, so it wasn't as clear. For a medical, you had to have a higher resolution, narrow angle, and stereo. So that actually makes, even though it's through the same camera, and most cameras do have the dual modes, that it's a different procedure. So then what you do, is you build the medical is 92250, uh, and you build the, the uh, non-medical one to the patient, either as, and there's two different S codes for fundus photography, or we actually tell people, they can make up the code. This is only going to the patient. You can call it fundus. You can do whatever you want. Um, and But you, it's not just using S code versus the 92250. It's specifically the procedure must be different. And we see people that do a, a perform a fundus photo, the same one on both. If you get audited and the uh, auditors look at that, they will hit you on that. The other thing, obviously, and we'll be talking about this later, is that the fundus photo, for medical reasons, does require an interpretation report, whereas the wellness does not. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we can continue. Okay. Uh, coding Pearl. Uh, fundus photos for diabetes without complications. Uh, the reason why I talk about this is because it's something that we are asked fairly frequently about, and it, it varies by region, but some regions do allow you to bill uh, a fundus photo, and in some cases, they also allow you to do a visual field and or uh, a um, scanning laser uh, for people with diabetes without complications. However, there are also some states that do not allow it. We actually show, obviously, in, in each state or each region when you can do a, fun, uh, a funded photo or any other procedure for diabetes without complication. Clearly, if it's 250.50123, that's uh, diabetes with ocular manifestations, then there's a whole slew of procedures that you can do for that as well as 
the procedure for the ocular manifestations itself. I think it's really slowed down and um, changing screens. Hey, Craig, can you put, uh, make it so, it, it, since it's on your computer, get this faster, uh, go to the next screen. Okay. No, one too far. Back. Okay. Here's where the, is an example we're actually showing, and in this case, and if you look at it, what's happening is for fun photos with, uh, excuse me, Diabetes without complications, there's the, the, the diagnosis code, 250.00. Um, we're showing you can do fun photography as well as extended ophthalmoscopy. Uh, notice the difference on the exams. Because diabetes is not an ocular di uh, diagnosis, in many states it supports an E&M exam but does not support a 92,000 ophthalmic exam. So that's why we want to show this particular one. Um, Systemic meds, this is a big one, uh, particularly for wellness of patients. Um, here's what we want you to do. You should make sure your front desk staff, pre-test staff, whoever's taking history, et cetera, even for your wellness refractive patients, record the systemic meds that they're on. The reason why is because, and we actually show this in i -Corps, we show you for all the systemic meds, what the common side effects are, and what the severe side effects are. The first step is if you, because you, you look for a wellness patient and you now look to see if you see any of these side effects, if you do, you can then treat this patient medically for those side effects. The big one is what follows here. If the med has a severe ocular side effect, in this case we show the list, and by the way, just so you know, this is not what we determine as common and severe. This is actually between uh, the FDA and the manufacturer determine what's severe and what's common, and then uh, we get our information from them. And what you can do is actually code the V5869 diagnosis code, and this is what would typically, not every case, that I actually have one for New York, but this is fairly typical where now you can do fundus photography, extended ophthalmoscopy, visual field, and in some cases the color vision exam. Some regions allow you to do an exam, some do not. But now think of this, because this is where it's important. Again, this is where the patient, even if they are not experiencing any of those severe side effects, um, that you can perform those procedures medically on this patient. That's a significant increase in reimbursement. It's also a significant benefit for the patient, as I said earlier, where you are going to make sure, now I have to go back. Again, we're showing you the severe side effects. Again, I'm repeating, even if the patient is not experiencing any of those, those are the procedures that you can perform and bill. Now, was, remember when we talked about the wellness uh, exams, if the patient, the patient doesn't even have to come back. As long as you don't have to have referral for medical or whatever, make sure all that's taken care of by your front desk staff up front, even for your wellness patient. That's another thing we always tell our practices. If you, even with wellness patients, get their medical insurance, verify their medical coverage, so if you do flip this patient into medical, you know exactly what's going on. You know what the copay is. You know what the uh, if the referral is required, et cetera. So it's very critical to have. But so now you can perform on that patient just because they're on that systemic med. Fund this photo, a, a visual field, for example, in addition to their wellness. You bill this medically, and you bill your wellness exam for the wellness insurance. When we first started showing this a few years ago, our, the doctors both at our lectures, our doctors that are users of ours, were telling how powerful this was for both increasing reimbursement and how it was a major impact on the patient 
to diagnose these things at a much earlier stage. So again, benefit to you, benefit to your patient. Very critical thing. So for example, we have the patient. So fine photography, visual field, extended ophthalmoscopy. Uh, now in this case, we're showing an ophthalmic exam. So essentially, if you're doing it the same day as your wellness exam, you can take that off. But if you have them come back for another day, now you're talking about the $344 of average reimbursement in addition to a previous day's uh, wellness exam. Uh, I actually just got a call from somebody today about this, about ICD-10 implementation. Everybody's all freaked out about it. Um, they had actually said by October of this year, they were going to, uh, CMS was going to implement ICD-10. Uh, no, and absolutely no delay on that date. And then last year they came out with another notice that they were going to delay it until October of 2014. The only issue is that on October of 2015, they're planning on implementing ICD-11, which is actually a superset of 10. Uh, there's really no major uh, changes except for expanded information and more for diagnoses um, in um, 10 to 11, but going from 9 to 10 is a major change. So we actually feel that what's going to happen is that they'll probably delay 10 or not even implement 10 and just go right to 11 in 2015. Uh, it's going to happen at one point. We're actually the only country in the world that uses ICD-9. All the other countries use ICD-10. So hopefully it will be a cleaner implementation of ICD-10 across the board than when back years ago uh, trying to implement the metric system in this country, which was a total disaster. Interpretation report, very, very, very important thing because we're seeing uh, this is a major reason for audit the practices, a major hit. Interpretation and in report alone, even if your exams are compliant and you're not doing them properly, uh, the insurance companies per solo practitioner are usually getting between forty and $60,000 on an audit for interpretation report. We find uh, that about 80% of both optometrists and ophthalmologists are not doing them or not doing them properly. Uh, there's very specific requirements for them, and, it, and the requirements are not well understood. Uh, a number of people want to know what procedures. This is actually from our software, but we actually list all the procedures that require an interpretation and report. Here's what we see for, the, uh, for a lot of practices or doctors that are trying to do it or think they're doing it properly. We see uh, re, uh, articles in opt optometric management, review optometry. We see the EMR systems that have, quote, interpretation report built in. And typically what we read or see is where they say we have to do clinical findings. The problem is that's not sufficient. In addition to clinical findings, you also have to do comparative data changing addition. For the diagnosis that you perform this procedure on, is the patient's condition better, worse, or stable? And then finally, how are you managing this patient? You must have all three categories. This is where we see, when I said about 80% of ODs and MDs are not doing them or not doing them properly, actually the majority think they're doing them properly or doing them but they're not complete, they're only the clinical findings. If all you have is clinical findings, you will not pass an audit on an interpretation or report. If you can't produce this as a single report, and this is where a lot of EMR systems fall down and their users get in trouble uh, when they're audited, you have to be able to show on one report all three of these categories. In terms of, I have always asked this question, uh, for example, visual field or anything else that prints out some kind of report. You can write this on the back of that paper as long as you have, again, all three categories. Typically what we see is just a finding. That does not work. In addition, 
if you are doing another procedure that requires an interpretation report for the same patient on the same day, you must have a completely separate report with all three categories filled in. We see a number of doctors and some EMRs that allow you, for example, on this photography and in the same line visual field and all three. That will fail an audit every time. You must have a separate report for each procedure. And that's the other part. It can't be part of the exam findings. If you produce it, for example, when I said you have to be able to produce one report with just the INR. If it has, if it's all intermingled with different things on an exam, they will find you non-compliant. And again, I also mentioned about the uh, your cost. And, uh, the audit uh, typically results in between forty and sixty thousand dollars. Coding in EMR. Um, I already mentioned this, so I'm just going to go go by this. Um, I will ask again now, are there any questions based on what I've just covered? Robert, yes, a couple other questions have come in. The uh, first one here is, uh, does the fact that the procedure is on the LCD list of your Medicare administration also mean that they can consider the procedure to be medically necessary? That's correct. Okay. Does the color vision exam include the 14-plate Ishihara book? The Farnsworth D15 or D100, or do you actually need a color meter? Uh, no, the color vision. Th th there's a number of issues with color vision exam, and I actually meant to take that off that previous slide. And it's unfortunate because we actually talked with somebody who was president of one of the companies that had the color vision you know, uh, uh, instrumentation, um, and that is they, that. Uh, LCD has been severely restricted with there's very few uh, diagnoses that support that, but it does not have to be just done with the any type of uh, uh, instrumentation. It could be done anyway. There is no clear-cut uh, re uh, requirement for what a color vision exam is. We've checked into this for a number of reasons. It's, it's just like there's some of the other things that are sort of nebulous about what their definition is. Another good one is a serial tonometry. It's, everybody knows it's multiple readings. It, previously it was that it was um, four or six different readings on the same day. That's not necessarily true anymore. As a matter of fact, you can get better results and it ties in with other things. You could do, for example, two in the afternoon or three in the afternoon on one day have the patient come back the next morning and do three. There are no set requirements on how that's spaced out. So in that case, for color vision, no, it really doesn't matter. Okay, another question just came in. How do you fill out an IAR for an initial set of photos for a diabetic? For initial? Yes. Real simple. Your change of condition, comparative data, it simply says initial photo. Or if it's the first time you did a field, initial field. That's all you have to have, but you have to indicate that it was the first time you did it for that patient. Thank you, Robert. You can continue. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into the fun part. Before you get all freaked out about this, and every time I do this, people get really upset or we do an audit, we're, I'm going to go through and really explain all the stuff that we see, all the things we see as results, uh, the top reasons for audits, for negative findings. But one of the things I'm going to stress now, and I'll stress at the end, is that once you know about this, it really is very simple to correct yourself. Uh, for example, last week we did an audit for a practice where they were noncompliant on, uh, they provided us with 50 exams. Of that, only three were co uh, compliant, all the rest were noncompliant. Uh, as a result, they were really upset about this because they thought that they were compliant. But everything we showed, or found, and showed them what to do, they could change immediately. And that's what we want to get across to you. Most of the things that we find can be changed immediately. So that that's the good news. So let's talk about the audits. All the payers, Medicare, Blue Cross, VSP, and you name it, they're increasing their audits and the number of their auditors. Some are announced and some are unannounced. 
I already said that's the average. Um, uh, somebody uh, called me last week about this, uh, and they heard something about this and thought there were scare taxes. No, it's not. Those are real. We see them all the time. The, I've talked with a number of different auditors. They see the same thing. One of the big things the auditors, and I honestly don't remember if I have it in the slide, so I'll talk about it now, um, is that uh, in all the audits we've done, and there's two, basic, there's two types of audits we do, where we go in before anybody, any insurance companies and just make sure that your, audit, your exam record documentation is clean, and if it's not, we document exactly where you have to do it. The other one are post audits. That's where we go in after a practice has been audited by an insurance company and has been hit with a uh, penalty. And so we look at the stuff. And in every audit we've done, we have never found anybody committing fraud. In every case, the doctor has done the, docu the documentation the way they were taught to do, trained to do, the way their EMS system has them do it, et cetera. But in almost every case, they're not compliant, so that you have to be careful about it. Even talking with the auditors, they say when it comes to optometrists, they almost never find anybody committing fraud. They said the same thing. They, the doctor thinks they're doing it right. They're not, so they have to hit them. So that's why we want to make sure. They are random. Uh, the causes, some are requests for documentation uh, where when you pr produce the documentation, that could be an interpretation report. It can be an exam. Uh, and it's either not compliant or you don't fulfill the request. Uh, uh, interpretation report, as I said, um, a number of doctors think that uh, billing in excess of the regional norm, we almost never see it. The only time we ever saw one case was a doctor uh, for VSP, and it was an interesting situation because this doctor specialized in medical contact lenses. That was his specialty practice. He had a huge practice. And he got hit by DSP. He got hit to the tune of $195,000. And we did a post audit for him and got almost all of that re, re, uh, completely wiped out. The issue is, you know, that DSP, but a regional norm typically does not cause an audit. That's not what they're looking for because they realize that different, different practices do different things for different amounts. Uh, VSP, I'll do this very briefly, they perform unannounced audits. Uh, they demand the records immediately. Um, here's what a couple of cases we've run into. One time a doctor was audited by VSP. They walked in at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and demanded to have a, a quite a significant number of exam records and claims and some other information immediately and gave them until 12 o'clock to do it. This practice had a completely full schedule. The waiting room was completely packed when the auditor walked in. The doctor came out, told them there was no way his staff could do it, and the auditor said, you have to comply with this way or we'll find you noncompliant. And he ended up calling his lawyer, who called the VSP lawyer, and the VSP lawyer said, we give you no time whatsoever. You have to do it right away, even though the VSP guidelines for practitioners specifically state that you can perform, provide that information in a reasonable time. And they would not do that. Had another case where a doctor was on vacation. Unfortunately, she left her office open for the, uh, uh, for the um, uh, dispensary area. And what happened was a VSP auditor walked in, demanded all the records. Uh, the front desk staff could not get in touch with the doctor. She was away someplace on vacation. He left, he found her completely non-compliant only because she was on vacation and he didn't get the records. So they're not they're not a friendly group, but so you have to be very careful about that. So let's talk about the top ten reasons for um, um, neg for um, an audit negative finding. Medical decision making not supporting the exam level. Um, this one, it's either the amount of complexity of the exam doesn't support it, the diagnosis and management doesn't support it, or the patient risk, all components of the thing. You've got to make sure that the documentation supports the level of the exam coded. One, um, let me stay here for a second on this, because one of the things, we, we actually did an audit 
for uh, was the, the doctor was hit by Blue Cross for 170 something thousand dollars, and uh, we went in and did a post audit and we looked at the exam and except for one certain set of exams, which was um, not a major con contributing factor to that. Everything else he did, the, the documentation supported, the diagnosis supported it, and the auditor found him that said the diagnosis didn't support a level three or in some cases a level four. And when I looked at it, they were either glaucoma, not suspect with glaucoma, or in some cases they were macular degeneration and some other severe things. So when we had the hearing, we had uh, we filed an appeal and had a hearing with the do the doctor, uh, with uh, the auditor, her supervisor, and the head of auditing for Blue Cross. And so we went through those things, and I said, "Do you realize with this uh, this diagnosis?" And we went through glaucoma, we went through AMD, and the bottom line was this auditor had no clue what the diagnoses were and just said, oh, that's not serious, and just went through it and said, no, these exams are denied. When we explained the consequences of not treating this, they reversed every one of those things. And so it's another thing to be careful about, because not all the auditors really know what they're doing, especially since there's been a big push by the insurance companies to hire new people. Uh, inappropriate uh, supporting the exam level. Uh, this is something we see time and time again when we do an audit, and it just blows my mind, where they have a refractive diagnosis either as the primary or the only diagnosis, and they're building a medical exam. Obviously, that's not going to support it. Uh, incorrect diagnosis code, just a wrong diagnosis code. Um, and again, this is where I've talked about make sure the auditor knows what the codes, what the diagnoses are. Insufficient exam elements. Um, uh, I was actually very pleased uh, with an audit we did very recently where the, pr the doctor in every case, at, for every single exam we looked at, had every single exam element. So of the total of 14 exam elements, they always did every one, regardless of the level of the exam built. Very nicely done. But in many cases, that's not what we see. And we don't see enough exam elements. And the way it works is for a comprehensive exam, you need to have 10 exam elements. There's a list of um, uh, 14, uh, 12 elements, 11, excuse me, 11 elements in one area that you must choose eight of those for a comprehensive exam. And then the plus two is where you have to do for that type of an exam, comprehensive ophthalmic, ocular motility, and gross visual fields. Those are required. All the others are optional as long as you eight of those 11. Uh, for an intermediate exam, again, uh, ophthalmic, it's two plus one of those. And then for an E&M exam, you have to have nine elements for a level three exam. You have to have 14 elements for a level four or a level five exam. Uh, it, this is also a case, and we actually have seen two different things in several EMR systems where the doctor has sworn that we see test results, but in the exam documentation, there's nothing in where the doctor did not put in, or the pretest app or whoever did not put it in actually in the exam. Another case we've seen, and we've actually have seen this with two different popular, very popular EMR systems, where when you look at the document, the exam, and the doctor, we know the doctor has put it in, and when you look and they print out the exam information for the auditor, it this stuff missing. But when we went on the system, you see it. So that's another thing you have to be careful about to make sure that what you what you actually entered into the system is actually getting printed out if you have a request for records. Review of systems. Um, I always recommend that you always go to the highest level, and I'm just going to go through all of these right away so that you can see what they are. There are actually 14 uh, systems in review a system. Best way to do it, make sure you do all 14. Make sure that every time the patient comes in, all 14 are reviewed. Uh, that way, and with history that's coming up, uh, uh, you'll always have everything done in the chief complaint, uh, patient history, uh, personal, family, social, and review a system. 
why that's important is let's say you typically bill, if it's an E&M exam, you bill level three. And now you find multiple uh, uh, diagnoses that would, in fact, support a level or maybe even a level four or maybe even a level five exam. If you haven't current done the full uh, history, chief complaint, and review a system, now somebody has to retake all that. So the best way is always do it at the highest level. It's the cleanest way to do it. It's not that difficult to do. Here's the first time I'm going to talk about the pull following for a previous exam. Anybody that has an EMR system, because it does slow you down from paper, the problem is all of these EMR systems have put in that one-click pull forward. It is not compliant. We've seen this before. Uh, we've Medicare, Blue Cross, all the insurance companies keep on saying it's not compliant. However, they really never published anything until October of last year where they specifically, for CMS specifically stated, you can't do it without being able to review everything. I'm going to quickly go through what that means. And it applies to the history, and it applies to the review assistance. And that is if you pull something forward and you have one checkbox or one button that when you push it or click it, it says, I've reviewed all these elements and everything's the same. If that's all you can do, it will fail an audit. And we see this all the time with the auditors failing different records because of that. You must be able, in order to be compliant, to pull something forward from a previous exam, your EMR system, and we talk to every EMR vendor out there. Some of them are making the changes. Some have made the changes. And some are not doing it. At least we don't see any signs of it yet. And that is that you must be able, so if I have 14 review assistance elements, you must be able to click each one of those to confirm each one or a text box where you can do the, the, the change. Same thing for history, same thing for medication. Why? Uh, and it really makes sense, and this is why the insurance companies go after this. If you ask a patient, are you on the same meds you were a year ago or six months ago, whatever the last visit was, What's their response going to be? Yes. But if you go through that list and ask them, ask them each individually, they're going to say, oh, I'm not on that one. I'm on this one instead. That's why the, the insurance companies won't allow it. It's not for the benefit of the patient. It slows you down further. We understand that. But you need to be compliant. And again, if you can't demonstrate that you're making those changes or reviewing each element, if you get hit with an audit, they're going to hit you for uh, cloning. That's actually called cloning of records. It's not allowed in those circumstances. I've already, what I said to you about the right way to do it, uh, that's the only way that you can do it and be compliant. History, the same thing. History actually is fairly simple. And that is that what you have is the following. There are three categories, personal or past, family, and social. The most comprehensive is that you have to have three elements. That applies to the level four and level five E&M exams. It also applies to a comprehensive ophthalmic exam. It's very simple to have at least one personal, one family, and one social. So always coded at that level. You can now do any exam based on that particular level. So again, that's something that's easy to uh, make compliant. Um, the other thing is we see, and we see this fairly frequently, where there's either no history or there's wrong history or the EMR system defaulting to something else. And we've seen some things that are very bizarre. We actually just recently did a thing um, where the practice had a patient coming in for glaucoma then in the eye history, it said no eye, uh, uh, no uh, eye history problems, and on the patient per patient history, it said glaucoma none, and that was all because of the way the EMR system was defaulting and the way the, pre the doctor or the pretest staff used that particular thing. Those would cause a failure or in an audit review. So you need to make sure that you're doing that properly. Chief complaint, always, always, always use four elements. The other thing we see where, um, one thing we see is where a medical exam and the HPI or 
reason to visit, chief complaint, whatever you want to call it, is eye exam. That will not pass in a medical. It will pass on a refractive, not in a medical. Always have the four elements. You know, for example, I always go through the thing, you know, floaters. I had them for two years. They affect me daily and affect my vision. There's your four count. Very simple to do and maintain from visit to visit. Um, it's not necessarily the first thing the patient says. It can be determined throughout the exam process. Um, one of the things that changed a couple of years ago, and many doctors are not aware of this, it doesn't even have to be determined on, based on what the patient says. The doctor can do it. So in a, uh, an exam, if you're doing a wellness exam and you find glaucoma, and you can see the severity of increased optic nerve six months ago, and it's continuous, the doctor can actually define the four elements of chief complaint, not just the patient. One of the other things we see on chief complaint is where it doesn't match the diagnosis for the exam. Uh, and it, in many cases, that would cause a, a failure for an exam uh, being passing. Again, this one, just what you said, it's very simple. Uh, this one I've also added because if it, uh, we hear this all the time. If it's not the patient chief complaint, you can't bill it. Well, I always pose the following. When was the last time a 70-year-old patient on their own with no previous diagnosis walked into your practice and said, oh, by the way, I have primary open angle glaucoma. It doesn't happen. However, when there's a patient, when they're leaving the chair, exam is over, and they may something, say something, oh, by the way, I have these flashes of light in my eye, or I'm on a plaque with that. The point is, chief complaint is not necessarily what the patient says at the beginning of the exam. It can be determined by any point of the examination, and it can, anything based on that can be built for that exam. Um, this is a big one. Actually, it's the number one uh, reason for an a comprehensive ophthalmic exam being denied during an audit. It's the number one reason CMS publishes on the different uh, procedures on why they're denied. When I've discussed this with the auditors, they said it's the first thing they look for. It is a requirement of a comprehensive ophthalmic exam, initiation of diagnosis and treatment plan. You must have one of the, there's actually five, but these are the three that really apply to optometry, a new prescription of lenses, medications, or therapy, arranging a, a diagnostic or treatment service. I'm ordering a fundus photo or a uh, visual field, whatever. I have this patient has a retinal issue. I'm referring it out to a retinal specialist. Under that category of initiation diagnosis treatment, you must have that title in your EMR system or on your paper records and identify which of these three that you've done. You only need one to be compliant, but it's, again, number one reason for denial of a comprehensive ophthalmic exam during an audit and why it becomes expensive is because an audit like that typically takes place a year or more after the bill was submitted. So in addition to having to give back all the reimbursement for that exam, you also have interest and penalties which far exceed the actual reimbursement. So be very careful about this. A number of EMR systems do not have that in them. Paper records, big, the biggest one actually is in eligible, it's getting late, uh, records. Uh, we're all in a rush, but you've got to make sure that you can it's readable. We actually did a uh, pre-audit for practice, and he had paper records. I looked at his records, the very first one with him in front of me. I said, I can't read any of this, and he grabbed it out of me. He was really mad, took it back, said, I know what this is, but I said, if, you can't, if the auditor can't read it, it doesn't matter. And I said, make a deal. You go out to your front desk staff, pick any one of your front desk staff, and see if they can read it, I'll say okay. And of course, he said, never mind, and we would continue to that point. It is, this is the number one reason I feel that's worthwhile going to an EMR system. If your handwriting is that bad that you can't read it or somebody else can't read it, because if you get audited and that you can't, that can't read the records, you're going to lose the audit. Uh,
owned records. We talked about this before, one-click poll forward. Um, you know, one of the things I thought was very interesting when I talked about this before, uh, one of the auditors told me that uh, she actually went to a, um, uh, a, co a, a conference uh, and went to the booth for an EMR vendor and told them where their exams were not compliant. And the people and identified her as an auditor, in this case she was from Blue Cross. And the people at the booth said she didn't know what she was talking about, her, her exams were compliant. And she had already hit a number of practices with that EMR, that's why she took the time to do it. Uh, so it's a very serious thing to make sure your EMR system is compliant. We see many of them that are not. And again, why you can't do the click forward, it is for the benefit of the patient. Here's another case. The actual report from the auditor specifically told the doctor to contact the EMR vendor saying where they, she specifically took the time to identify where their EMR system was not compliant. And then what happened was um, that the, the EMR vendor said, no, it's not a problem. He actually, the doctor provided him with the report from the auditor. The EMR, the president of the EMR software said, no, we're not going to fix it. So it is something that we see a uh, problem. This case, we actually did it. It was done uh, at the beginning of this year. And so anything pre-October 2012, I said, you haven't notified him. You really can't go over it. So it was reversed, but that doesn't work anymore for anything since October of 2012. Everybody's been notified by them, at least on their website. Not that they've been personally notified. Insurance companies uh, say have the uh, uh, take the position that as long as they put something on their website on restrictions or what you can do and not do, that's all they have to do to notify you. They do not have to send anything specifically to you. Interpretation reports uh, is absolutely the number one thing we see uh, for audits. Uh, it is a major issue. And the unfortunate part is a lot of people don't, still don't believe this or they don't do them properly. It's very simple to do properly. You know, you really need to see what's going on. Here's some of the things we see on insurance audits. We are on, uh, you know, um, all of a sudden now this is going way forward. Okay, hopefully it'll stop. All right, as I said, uh, when we do audits, both pre-audits and doing a post-audit after an insurance company, the audits actually do average at right between that $100,000 and $200,000. We see doctors where their audits, uh, I've seen it uh, as high as $195,000 it's somebody that's actually fairly close to where we are. We went in there, looked at it, and got almost all that reversed. Uh, almost every doctor I talk to says, I believe my records are compliant, but I just want to do it for peace of mind. And every time we do it, we find that their records are not compliant. Uh, luckily, there's, there, most of the things we find are actually simple to correct, but you need to make sure you correct them. Uh, as I said, we've, rarely, we've never found fraud. The insurance auditors said they really find fraud. They also, the doctors truly believe, they, the auditors have said that, with, with the doctors documenting properly, but the fact is they're non-compliant records and they have to find the doctors. There's no way around it. So as I said, the good news, it's easy to correct immediately. So for example, you're not doing a full HPI, thief complaint. Make sure you do the four elements. You're not doing full history. Make sure you do one element for every patient, a personal, a path, family, and social. That's all you have to do. Uh, it goes for, right across the board for all of those. Um, if you, the interpretation, if you're not doing a compliant interpretation report, for again, for example, where you have those three categories, clinical condition, what did I see, what did I find? Change in condition, comparative data. Is the patient better, worse, stable? Or if it's the first time, it's just say it's the first time you perform the procedure. And finally, clinical management, what am I doing to manage this patient for that diagnosis? 
So if you start doing those changes right away, that can make you compliant. Um, if you're cloning, you've got to stop immediately. It's something, you, you know, I, I see this as a major issue, especially with some EMR systems where they, um, it's very difficult to do, make changes to what's pulled forward. You have to, and if that's the case, have your pre-test staff or have somebody else do it every time the visit to the patient comes in. If you continue cloning and you only have the option says, I've looked at everything and it's all the same, and you get audited, you will get hit for that exam. You will lose that exam. There is no question about that. We see that all the time and all the auditors are saying. Uh, if you follow the guidelines that I talked about, those are the actual requirements. You should be compliant. Um, most medical insurance auditors are fair. One of the things I talk about, and I have practice, so I haven't done my INRs, or I haven't done them properly, or I'm not doing my exams compliantly. What we tell them is when you know about this, immediately change what you do so that you're compliant, and then we actually, and then move forward. If you get hit with an audit after that, we always tell them, tell them on such and such a date, you were at a webinar or a seminar or somehow else, you learned that you were not compliant and immediately changed everything, and you show them that, we have never seen a case where an auditor will hit you because of that. Uh, we see them typically with the auditors, as long as you don't lie to them, they see that you've corrected what you were doing incorrectly, and then they will have you completely clean on that particular audit for whatever the reason. So just make sure you're always compliant and that you don't, uh, you don't give them the wrong information. Uh, just real quickly, this is one that I always talk about. Uh, this one actually is an actual case study. It actually is somebody uh, that was a user of ours, and he said he had incomplete documentation, no uh, justification for procedures. What do I mean by that? Worst possible scenario. This is where he specifically said to one of my staff members, he was asking some coding information, that when she said about the different diagnoses that he was using, and he, he admitted he was actually making up diagnoses for these patients just so he could fill certain procedures. That is fraud, no matter how you cut it or whatever. So she passed them to me, and I told him, you can't do it. And his excuse was that unless he did it, he couldn't afford to be in practice. My response to him was, find another line of work. Several months later, he called me and said he was being audited, and he got hit with $15,000 fine penalty in interest. Should he take it or should he fight it? I said, given the fact, knowing what you do, you better pay it and be happy. Well, he decided he was going to fight it, and then what happened was he was hit with a $50,000 uh, fine penalties and interest, and then finally uh, he asked me again, and he was hit with 80000 That's the last time I heard from him. I haven't heard from him since. But the bottom line is, if you know what you've done is wrong, I always say fess up and settle. Uh, don't try to mislead them. It will get you in more trouble. However, if you know what you've done is right, don't be afraid to fight it. Make sure all your documentation is complete and accurate. Make sure you have complete, compliant INRs, and you've done justified medical necessity when you do a procedure. You can, uh, should, can and should be doing medical. It is a significant increase in reimbursement, and you need to evaluate wellness patients to determine if they have a medical eye problem so you can bill that. Uh, there. And with that, I am done. If there are any questions, if anybody, this, this uh, screen, and I know they're going to be putting this up, but if you, have, uh, if you want uh, copies of this, you can see on the bottom my email address. You can email me, and I will get a presentation to you, uh, handouts. Uh, if you have any questions, there's the information to get in touch with me. If you have anything you uh, about the instrumentation we talked about in the first part of the lecture about Oculus Cam or any of the other instrumentation, you can call them at that toll-free number. You can also email them at sales at oculususa.com. So with that, are uh, there any other questions that came in since the last time? Uh, yes, Robert, I will mention a few of the questions here. Um, one of them is... The, uh, 
Does a diagnosis have to be a chief complaint or just a complaint? Uh, the diagnosis does not have to be a chief complaint. Uh, the diagnosis, a chief complaint could be something like blurred vision or whatever, and then when you actually do the exam, you find cataracts or glaucoma or whatever, that becomes the diagnosis. It does. We recommend that on follow-up visits, though, so that would be in one scenario, on follow-up visits where the patient is back for a glaucoma check or some other retina or some retinal or any medical issue, that that should be the chief complaint in that case. Thank you. Uh, can a patient review previous RLS social and family history and make corrections with red pen and sign? Yes. And actually, the, probably the most popular EMR system out there, I shouldn't say popular, the most used EMR system out there, does not allow for the modification of that information that's been pulled forward. We actually came up with a form that where the patient would fill in the very first time or the next visit, if you haven't started to use this before, and add history, medications, review of systems, all of that stuff, and there are five columns in addition to the first one where that can be reviewed for five subsequent visits, even if there's five a year between it. And then what we actually had this, uh, this practice do was scan in that record. Now they have everything there and didn't use it from the, uh, the chief complaint, not the chief, but the history part of the, quote, EMR system. Then when the patient came in again, they printed that out from the EMR system, that scanned image, and the patient could fulfill everything in and sign it again and then date it and they could scan it in again. It automatically turned this very difficult EMR system to be compliant into a very easily. Yes, it's going into paper, but at least they were compliant and it was up to the patient to do and put. As long as the doctor or somebody in a pretest staff reviews what was done, that's all that's necessary. Thank you. Uh, another one here is uh, blurry vision, refractive error, or one-year cataract follow-up acceptable for billing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, I see no reason why not, unless there's uh, something else behind the question, but yeah, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. For inter interpretation and reports for fundus photos, do we need colored drawings? No. You don't get to make no. The only time, remember, fundus photo is a photo. You don't need anything else. That is the that is what you've done. What you need those colored photos for is for extended ophthalmoscopy. And in that case, you have, there's very specific requirements. It has to be at least a 3x3 three three or a 3x4 three drawing. Uh, the requirements are no pre-printed vessels, veins, et cetera, or features where you have to draw all that stuff in. That's where the drawing comes in, and it's on extended ophthalmoscopy, not fundus photo. Fundus photo, the photo itself is that, and then you simply have those three categories for the interpretation of the fundus photo. Thank you. Um, another one here. Going back to the cloning issue, if every finding is exactly the same as last year, are you suggesting that I, sh that I should change the learning of my findings? Well... Changing the wording doesn't, whether you say I've reviewed all this stuff or however you want to reword that, unless you can show on your EMR system that you actually went into each of those items, that doesn't work. So changing the wording doesn't help. It's the fact that it, regardless of the wording, it's the fact that you're not demonstrating on the EMR system, which is what the the auditors are looking for that you went into each element to review each element. And the only way to do that is to be able to check each element or type in something new for one of those elements. Uh, there was one uh, audit we did a couple of weeks ago, and their EMR system was actually quite slick. There were other things that were not good about it, but one of the things I did like about theirs is the fact you could go in and pull up and you would see everything there, and it was very simple to either make changes or check that each, uh, each element was the, was the same, but again, you have to be able to check each element as being the same, not just one motion to say everything. That's the key. Regardless, the wording doesn't matter. Thank you, Robert, very much for this evening's webinar. Uh, that's it for questions for now. If any of the questions that were not answered, we can answer those through email.
Uh, I, and I'll thank you all for uh, participating in this. It's been the end of a long day, and uh, um, thank you all for participating. And with that, I guess we're done, right? Yes, we are. Great. Thank you very much, Robert. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have yourself a good evening.